The National Training Center held diversity and inclusion training as part of Resiliency Week, July 20th at the Freedom Fitness Center. The event gave insight into influencing factors that affect soldier personal readiness within their day-to-day -day lives. During opening remarks, Brigadier General Jeff Broadwater, commander of the National Training Center and Fort Irwin, underscored the importance of resiliency and the unique opportunity to hear from keynote speaker Ben Lesser with his story of adversity during the Holocaust. You're going to hear a story of hate, okay? You're going to hear a true story of hate in the world uh, and how one person was fortunate enough to overcome some uh, events that I, you know, I can't imagine. I think that you all probably uh, have a hard time imagining some of the stuff that, uh, that Ben has been able to, to overcome in his life that he will share with you. Uh, and so when we talk about resiliency, it's more than a PowerPoint slide, right? It's about helping each other, making sure that we're doing the right thing in the United States Army and building the best team that we possibly can. At this time, please rise for the singing of the national anthem by Specialist Dana Clark from Operations Group. NTC Equal Opportunity Advisor, Sergeant First Class Zachary Conklin, began the training with formal introductions of the day's keynote speaker, Mr. Ben Lesser. Ben is also a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. As a Holocaust survivor, Ben was a pioneer in the resiliency practice before we ever knew what that was, and has continued to strive to be the best in everything he has done in the last 70 plus years since being liberated from the oppression of Adolf Hitler. I think I'm pretty safe here. <laughs> pretty safe. I look around. What a wonderful honor you gave me to come out and see me. You, I don't know how to, how to say it to you. You guys gave me life. You liberated me in the house. You gave me life. The 41st Infantry at the Hebrew Blessed liberated Dachau. And I think you all know what an important mission you have in life. And I'm so honored to be among you. I really am. Thank you for coming out. There are so many people that I have to honor for what's happening today. Um, General Broadwater, of course, he is the one who wanted me out here simply because it's Resilience Day, and believe me, I know what resilience was, and it is, believe me. And also, Sergeant Mike Duncan, who picked me up from Las Vegas and was constantly with me day and night, I want to thank you very much for you. I think he's out selling books, okay? Um, so make my stay here very comfortable. Sergeant Conklin, who coordinated everything. Thank you, Sergeant. There you go. Thank you. So, you know, survival Trust upon me a mission to do what I'm doing. For the last 27 years, I've dedicated my life to go around the schools and colleges and to anyone who will listen to tell my story because it's so very important. Most Holocaust survivors my age can't even talk about it. It hurts too much. It brings back too many memories sleepless nights, but I have the same thing. I get sleepless nights before I speak and after I speak. But someone has to do it. And if not, I who? And if not, now, when? So 
this had to be done. So it's not just speaking. I travel all over the world. I just came back from Germany. I was twice this year in Germany speaking in high schools and teachers and politicians. You can't imagine. Unfortunate is that I, a lot of people know me. And I couldn't possibly tell you my story in 50 minutes or an hour and a quarter. Um, that's why I urge you to say to read my book. You will not regret it because it's something that once in a lifetime you will experience. But it's not only a story, but it's also a teaching book. What you can do to stop this from ever happening again. And you certainly are the people that we hope will never have to do it. But you should know what went on. And I'll try to inform you as much as possible. I was born in Krakow, Poland. And then the war broke out September 1st, 1939. At that point, I was about 10 and a half. And I remember living in a building, of course, we had no way to show the pictures, um, in a three-story apartment house on a major street. And one early in the morning at 5 a.m., the whole building started to shake. And it was just like an earthquake. So I went to the window and I looked out um, and I saw soldiers. First, I saw tanks rolling down. Following the tanks, there were half tracks. And every few steps, one of the soldiers would jump out of the half track, get on the sidewalk. And this is how they occupied the city. And there was no fighting. Following them were the Wehrmacht, the foot soldiers with their shiny black shoes and their goose steps. It was quite impressionable for a ten and a half year old at the time. But I really had no idea what to expect. Uh, we kids didn't know. Now, if my parents knew something, they might have, but they wouldn't tell us. And I'm quite sure that they knew because Crystal Nacht, the night of broken glass, happened one year earlier in Germany, in Germany and in Austria. That's when they broke the Jewish shops, the windows, and, and they pilfered everything and they beat them up and 3,000 shopkeepers were all put in jail. Um, and they started to burn, burn Jewish books, burn temples, places of worship. Um, and all this happened one year before the war broke out. So I'm sure my father knew, but he wouldn't tell us. But no one really expected to what extent, because the human mind doesn't register to what extent these monsters were, were able to take this, imagine six million Jewish people and slaughtered. Some of them were turned alive, children, men, women, children. And I saw most of this happening. And the whole world was silent. Hitler first started burning books, Jewish literature. And the whole world was silent. It didn't matter anything what happens to the Jewish literature in Europe. But then they took a step further and they started to burn temples, places of worship. And the whole world was silent. Now it was like giving Hitler carte blanche, telling him it's okay what you do to the Jewish people. No one cares. Then he took it to the alternate and he started to burn human beings. 
six million of us. And not only Jewish people, there are a lot of um, other people who didn't agree with Hitler, they were all, many of them were killed. A million and a half of Jewish children were among the six million. And guess what? The whole world was silent. How is this possible? So, being here in an army base, I feel you people have to know, and I'm sure you do know what happened, to what extent hatred could lead. Could, could lead. I tell this in schools usually, I say, because there's a lot of bullying going on. I says Hitler and the Nazis were big bullies. And when you bully someone, you make an enemy for life. That person will not forget that he was bullied by you. So he will hate you. And then probably you will hate him. And this is what, what happens. Once you hate, it's easy to kill. So hatred has to stop. You have to stop. Remember one thing. Hatred and love, they're both contagious. So choose love. I hate. So, the fifth day after occupation of Krakow, at the gate, usually these buildings have a gate and there is a super who will unlock the light of night and unlock in the morning. At 5 a.m. they were banging on the gate um, and the super came running out with his short tail hanging on. What's going on? What's going on? All they wanted to know where the Jewish people were, the youth. And he was quick to oblige. One lived on this side of the building on the first floor and us the other side. And they came breaking down the doors, holding these sacks and beating us up, pistol whipping us throwing all your valuables, which, of course, we did. And whatever they saw, valuables, silverware, whatever, candelabras, everything went in. And they were beating up my father to open the safe. So while my father was opening the safe, the apartment with the other Jewish family, the other side, was a young couple and they had two daughters. One of them was about my age, because I remember it's playing with them after school. And um, I hear this, yeah, the mother had an infant or a little boy that she gave birth two months earlier. And we hear this screaming, the terrible screaming. So my sister Lola, the one who survived, and I ran through the kitchen to the back door and came in. And this is what we saw. Do me a favor, you know, so all this here from whoever was with them. Um, I think. Um, I'm going to mention that I think they're only nine years old, but I don't mention the words. He was holding the baby by his legs and screaming. And he screamed to the parents, make him shut up. And the parents were screaming, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby, the two daughters. I know we're screaming. And with a smirk on his face, I could see that he was enjoying this. He smashes the baby's head and the door goes killing the baby. Now, I could never, never forget that because that screaming baby, that sudden silence. And he enjoyed it. What kind of an animal can enjoy doing something like this? But even his bodies were a little shot because this was just the beginning of the war. Say, them and Hans, come on, let's go. And they took all of the stuff they had gathered and they threw it in the truck and disappeared. But that was the first taste of Nazi brutality, 
Let me stop there. Um, like you heard, new ordinances kept coming out. The Star of David couldn't work anymore for anyone. Um, and my father's business was wine and syrup. He had a wine and syrup factory, and he also had a chocolate factory. He was the first one to manufacture chocolate-covered wafers, like Kit Kat and Poland. Now, in those days, it was the shape of a little animal with some tinfoil covered. I remember every time my father came home, he kids used to search his pockets to see if he can find some goodies in there. But anyway, one day he goes to the wine and syrup factory and their guard station confiscated and they chased him away. They wouldn't even let him go in and take his briefcase. He goes to the chocolate factory the same way. Imagine a person working all his life to build up a little business for the family, provide and take him away. Just like that. But it didn't stop there. And then new ordinances came that you can't live. Jewish people cannot live in Krakow anymore. But they gave us a choice. The first time in history they did that. They gave us a choice. You can either live um, in the outskirts of Krakow, in a small community, or you can stay in Krakow and go into the ghetto. They made you ghetto. And I'm sure most of you know what the ghetto was. It was bad, solid condition, the bad, worst part of Krakow by the train track. And they were pushing in like eight to ten people in, in a room. Unbelievable, no plumbing, don't ask. But we decided to go into a small community, and I have to thank my sister because she had a young man who was in love with her and came to my father and says, Mr. Kodesh, you know how I feel about Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her. But do me a favor, I'll arrange for everything you can come to my town where we where we're going to move to. Anyway, the past. To tell you what we went through in that town is something that somebody would First of all, when the wagon with the driver and everything was loaded on, that's when we found out my father had a thousand American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. No one knew. Now, a thousand American dollars was a small fortune in those days. So he took the money and he took the prayer book from the religious book and he take it inside. He put it in the sack full of books. And now we're leaving to the small community outside of Krakow. And on the way, we're being stopped by the Nazis. Halt! Two husky Nazis jump in the wagon, and all they wanted to know, do you have any Jewish literature, books? And obviously, they saw, saw those books, and they picked them up and eat them on a mountain book on the side of the road, which they were going to have a bonfire once everyone passes. My sister Lola spoke a beautiful, beautiful German, and she walks up to him. And she says, my father is a writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book. He looked at her, maybe he was impressed the way she spoke. And he says, OK, I'll give you five minutes if you can find it. And you can imagine all of us climbing on a mountain of books. And these books, you know, as you climb on it, you keep sliding down. And after five minutes, we chased away and he's penniless, absolutely penniless. My future brother-in-law made arrangements for us to, to live in a house, in a farmhouse. The farmer was an apple orchard farmer, and we had the other side of the house. It was with the sash grove, you know, in a small town. And uh, my father wasn't the same person because how is he going to feed the family of self? I mean, not like we can go get a job, 
people who are not allowed, Jewish people are not allowed to be hired. So don't ask, but he comes. My future grandma heard about that, so he brought him a sack full of flour, a thousand pounds, I'm sorry, one hundred pounds of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake bread to feed the family because these buildings had an honor. Yeah. Can you all hear back there? You good? Start. Okay. He can probably just hold it. Okay. Testing. That's great. Anyway, he brought him a sack full of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake bread. My father took the flour. The minute he saw it, his face lit up. He took the flour. Instead of baking bread, he started to bake pretzels. Why pretzels? All you need for pretzels is flour, water, and salt. Those ingredients he had. Then he took those pretzels to the neighboring bars and offered them for sale. It was a novelty, and they started to buy the pretzels. So this is how he became a little baker in town, and I was 12 years old at the time. I remember baking with him. To this day, I'm still baking at home for the whole block, everybody and all our friends. Anyway, um, cookies, all kind of different things. But it didn't last long. My sister Laura got married, and my older brother got married, and they moved out of the house. Now, I had one sister in Hungary. My mother's side of the family comes from Hungary. So, every summer, my parents, my mother, would take us kids to Hungary to her family so that we get to know the grandparents, uncles and aunts in, in Hungary. In winter time, we would come back to Krakow. So one sister was saved, and Hungary was still a free country, but her grandparents there. But we were six to be fed, and my father somehow managed with the, with the um, pretzels, and then it became cakes and cookies, anyway. It didn't last long in where my sister moved in to a duplex. One side was owned, I mean the duplex was owned by the mayor of that community. And the mayor tells my brother-in-law, my sister, he says, Michael, Laura, I heard some rumors that something may happen to the Jewish people in our community either tonight or tomorrow night. Save yourselves. So when they heard it, right away, we snuck out in the middle of the night, we hired a, a driver with a horse and buggy, whatever we could carry, we put on it. Now the only place we could go was the next large city, which is called Bochnia. Bochnia had a ghetto. So that meant we had to go inside the ghetto. But Bochnia was known for the atrocities that were happening there. What would happen there? Every so often, once a three or four dump trucks would come inside the ghetto in the middle of the night, and they would go from house to house and pull out the children from their beds and throw them into these dump trucks. But you can imagine the children screaming for the parents, parents screaming for their children, and as soon as they filled up those three or four dump trucks, they would start to move out of the ghetto. Obviously, the, the parents were running behind these trucks and screaming for their children. The children are screaming for the parents. And these cultured, educated people civilized, 
had machine guns at the end of each drop. And they would mow down the parents who are running behind these trucks in front of their children. No one ever had knew what happened to these kids. Never heard of them again. But we can imagine. Now, we had no choice. We had to go and get in. But, you know, this is a very interesting story because they had a race there very often and how we were hiding and the rooms that I was put in that my father and my mother and my little brother had other eight people in it. So there were eight people and no beds, just straw on the floor and we had blankets over the straw, blankets hanging, dividing each family. Now you can imagine the living conditions. There was an outhouse in the winter time, it was something awful. But it, it didn't last long, but the raids, what happened, and after, the, after those stories with those kids, every house and every apartment had a hiding place, because we knew any day it could happen again. And one day, we found out there was going to be a raid that night, so I found out in our room there was an ambwa, a very nice piece of furniture, that was completely out of place because everything was boxes with chairs, a broken down table, a little oven, stove. And this beautiful armoire, we found out when we opened the door, you slide the clothing, the, the suits and coats to the side. The back panel would slide apart and there was a hole in the wall. And 12 of us in this room could climb through that hole and get to the other side of that wall. The last person obviously would put all the clothing back, close the door and the back panel back in its place. And there was a raid and all night long we heard screaming, yelling, dogs barking. And we stood there all night freezing. Now, we were between two buildings but the sky was open, and fortunately for us, the sides were connected to other buildings, so no one can see us. So we were fortunate we survived. But the next morning when we came out, this is what we saw, and you saw in the film, I explain it. Dead bodies, pieces of bodies, dogs were tearing the bodies apart, and they were putting in push cars and taking it to the middle of the camp and, and lighting a bone bonfire with, with gasoline. Anyway, how we escaped from Krakow, from Bochnia, from that particular ghetto, and we were able to escape to Hungary in a double-decker truck Ten people between the coal on top and the chassis on the bottom, there was room for ten people to spread like sardines next to each other. And this truck driver was paid a lot. He would take us to the Czech border and then we had to be smuggled across to Czechoslovakia. From Czechoslovakia to Hungary, Hungary was still a free country. I and my little brother went through okay, but I'm not, I don't have the time to tell you when we were stopped by the Nazis, but they didn't know that we were hidden in that truck. They just hitchhiked on the truck. Um, we kept our breath <laughs> from breathing for, for about two hours. And then they said, Danke schön, Danke schön, and when they didn't know. And when, how we crossed the border, and then from Czechoslovakia to Hungary is a story in itself. And we arrived into Hungary. But my mother and father were going to be the last to leave. And as they left, as they went into the truck, even though it was in a barn, at night, I guess a Polish farmer saw what was going on. They called the Gestapo. And they came out and they pulled out all ten people from the truck. 
including the driver, they lined them up and against the wall and everyone was shot, everyone was killed. So I lost my parents then. I had another older brother and he was already in a concentration camp in Pashov. He did not survive. But my sister Lola and I and my little brother, we were now on our way to Hungary and in Hungary we had family. My older sister lived there. Anyway, we came into Hungary and I tell the people about what's happening in Poland and she, they didn't believe it. This will never happen in Hungary because Hungary is an ally of Germany. Okay? One month, two months, but my uncle listened to me. I, my uncle was a very wealthy man and he had a store where he was selling fabric for suits and dresses. So I was with his son upstairs in the house above the store. And I tell my uncle, uncle, you know, all your valuables that you have, if the Nazis ever come into Hungary, they'll take everything away. Can you maybe change something into smaller tangible pieces of like diamonds or so people could put it in their pocket? He listened to me. And one day he comes home with boxes of shoes, brand new black shoes for every member of the family. He tells us that the heels of these shoes, there are diamonds. No, in case your life is threatened, if you can save yourself, know that you have those diamonds. Okay, what happened from then on? And sure enough, that in March, of 1944, the Nazis came into Hungary like they were invited guests. Well, the question is this. By that time, Hitler knew he was losing the war. Why would he siphon off soldiers from the front to occupy a friendly country, Hungary? It didn't make sense. But pretty soon we found out why. 800,000 Jewish inhabitants in Hungary. For Hitler to kill Jews was more important at that point than winning the war. He knew he was losing the war by then. And when they came into Hungary, they knew every person's name where they reside, where they live. He knew their education, their businesses, everything. How? They didn't have computers in those days like they do today. IBM had punch cards. And those punch cards they sold to Germany, giving them all this information. Now, IBM doesn't deny it, but they say they had no idea to what purpose they're going to use that information. It was a business transaction. And within two or three weeks later, in April, they started to transport people to the death camps from Hungary. And this is what they told us. You're going to be relocated to Germany. Germany needs workers. And take all your valuables with you that you can carry, but leave everything else behind. And anyone found hiding will be shot. Well, people believed it. Somehow it's easier to believe a lie than the, than the truth. But no one could think of the possible truth. It was beyond the human mind, the imagination. So they believed it. And we all carried our bundles with valuables and they took us to the um, in, in, in the towns that we were in, they took us to a, a brick factory 
why a brick factory? That's where they had tracks and the cattle cars were waiting for us. They lined us up, 82 cattle car, and they told us to go in. But before that, I want you to know, while we were waiting to get into the cattle car, I see two men with a stretcher walking right up to me and my uncle, and they lay down the stretcher. And I take a look at this, this a woman, I didn't recognize, that's my sister Goldie. Beautiful face, what happened to you, Goldie? I didn't recognize. So she says she tried to escape. She went as far as the railroad station and a Hungarian gendarme who went to school with her recognized her and he turned her into the SS. They beat her to a pulp. And now, she was a teenager, she was maybe 19 years old. Now they tell us to go in. 80 people to a car. Now, 80 people wouldn't be so bad if you didn't have all those bundles that everyone brought along. Now it was so tight that if you wanted to sit down, someone else had to stand up. And they had two buckets of water in the corner. Once the water was gone, one day, two days, three days, and there were no sanitary facilities, no place for human waste. So we started to use those buckets, and pretty soon those buckets were overflown. And now the human waste was slushing all over the floor. Day, night, that was the third night, we arrived at a place, and it, the train didn't stop, but he went by, but we can see lit up Oshmenshim. Oshmenshim was Polish for Auschwitz. So, we didn't know what it was. I never heard of it in Auschwitz. Nobody else did. And then they come into the camp area and it stop, and I see a, a gate, and it says, Arbeit macht frei. Labor gives you freedom. So we figured, makes sense, this is a labor camp and this is probably where we will work. The train stood there for about an hour and then it started to move again. It was nighttime. And it arrived at a place three kilometers away called Birkenau. Birkenau was part of Auschwitz. So, we didn't know where we were. They opened up the gate, the door, and people in striped suits and everyone starts yelling, leave all your belongings where it is. Women and children to the right and men to the left. And I had my uncle, my cousin, and somehow I went with the man. I figured if I am an adult, if I can work in a labor camp, they'll feed me better. And I'm holding on to my sister Goldie and my little brother Tully, and we're just being pulled apart, never to see each other again. They went straight to the gas chambers. We didn't know that. I didn't, didn't know about gas chambers. No one dreamt of those things. So we are in a strange place. It's night, and we see those chimneys with flames shooting out of them and smoke and ashes falling from the smoke all over. And every time it stepped, it's like stepping in snow, it left a footprint. And a funny smell. And as we are inching ahead, the man in front of me say that those must be smelting factories. This is probably where we will work. No one had any idea what these places are. So, when I come in front of a doctor, a man in a white frock, and he's going with a white glove, right, left, right, left, right, left. That was Dr. Mengele, the angel of death. Now he decided with a flick of his finger, who shall live and who shall die. We didn't know that, but 
before I came to him, there was a young man, maybe 20 years old, and he's asking, he comes to love five kilometers, can you run five kilometers? He said, yeah, well, no. Anyway, he said that he had a bad knee, he would rather go by truck. Poor soul not realizing that man is certain that. But who knew? But something didn't make sense to me. I was 15 and a half years old at the time. What didn't make sense is why would he ask such a question? I spoke German, so I knew. Why would you ask a question like that? We are in a camp, I can see barracks, and we finally get here. So I figured he's testing these people to see if they're strong enough to work. But I had no idea about gas chambers. So I tell my uncle, my cousin, whenever he asks you something, be sure you tell him you can work, you're healthy, you can run, anything. But let me go first. So I went, I was 15 and a half, and I stretched myself out and I tiptoed. And I salute him before he even asked the question. I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm 18 years old, I'm healthy, and I can work. A cable work. And he still asked me, comes to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers? I said, jawohl. He sent me to the left. My cousin and my uncle, they all went to the left. I, we had no idea. And then what we went through in the beds, and what happened to the diamonds, I don't have time to tell you. Except, I went through absolute hell. And you listened to what the Stubmelders, the, the man in charge of the barrack, what he told us. You think you're here on vacation? Think again. Those are your mother's, father's, brothers and sisters. You heard all the story there. Anyway, we couldn't believe it. My sister, Goldie, and my little brother, Tuli, dead. This is the 20th century. How is that possible? Not in the Middle Ages. And these cultured people are doing those things. We couldn't believe it. So I was there two weeks in, in Auschwitz. And what we went through, I don't have time to tell you. But then they loaded us in trucks and they took us out. And they took us to a labor camp. The labor camp was a rock quarry. So as they dynamited the mountain and the boulders came down, it was our job with sledgehammers to break them down to manageable pieces, throw it into mining carts, run it down the tracks to a grinding machine to make gravel out of it. And then push those things up again. It was very heavy work. And I figured my uncle is not going to survive it. So I bought with the diamonds that I had. I went to the chef in that camp. And I bribed him to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. Which he did. He did. And it was a little easier on us because he could eat in the kitchen. He couldn't bring anything out because they searched him. Anyway, every day when we came back from work, they would line us up and count us. And afterwards, they would dismiss us. We would go take our ration and go up in the barracks and shower or go to sleep. One day we come back, they count, they count. And they count. And then the commandant comes down with the Fräulein, a young... He was a big man, the commandant, and this young little woman next to him. And he says, I'm going to show the Schweinhund a lesson they'll never forget. I'm going to show these pig dogs a lesson they'll never forget. But well, what happened? Three inmates escaped. And because of this, he orders his henchmen to pull out every tenth person in line to receive 25 lashes. Well, as they're pulling out the people, I can see that my uncle, who was in front of me, was going to be a ten. And I figured he'll never survive a beating 
So I pulled him behind me and I took his place and sure enough they made me, pulled me out as a number 10. They took all of us number 10s in the middle of the yard. Their henchmen brought out two bundles of hardwood stakes about one by one inch, very sharp edges. And it's about two and a half to three feet long. And then they brought out a, um, a um, they call it a sawhorse. Uh, sawhorse, thank you. They brought out a sawhorse. Now you don't know what a sawhorse, most of you probably know. Two sawhorses, you put a log of wood on top to cut it. So it's like a triangle. It has two legs on each side, a two by four in the middle. And this is what he orders us to do. Tiptoe. Your heel cannot touch the ground. Put your knee inside the opening of the sawhorse. Bend over, but your stomach cannot touch the two by four on top. One man was pulling your trousers like a drum, while the other one was doing the hitting. And you had to count out loud. If you miscounted, you start from one again. If your heel touched the ground, you start from one again. And if your stomach touched the two by four, you start from one again. Well, it was almost an impossible task, and I was number four. There were three men ahead of me. Picture this. The first man walks up, puts his knees inside. One man is pulling his trousers real tight, and the other one is hitting, and he starts to yell, I spy, and finally, every time they hit him, you see a line of blood coming right through the trousers, because these one by ones were so sharp, hardwood. And anyway, he miscounted. He touched the two by four. His heel went down over again and over again. Finally, he collapsed. The commandant goes over and kicks him in the face. He says, get up. Obviously, this person couldn't. He pulls out his revolver and shoots him right in the temple. Kills him. His girlfriend, his fräulein, walks over to him, gives him a hug and a kiss, like he just performed some kind of a heroic act. Number two goes up. The same thing. He fell apart, he miscounted, he touched this, touched that. It was almost impossible. And he too, the commandant goes over, shoots him. Number three. Number three was a younger man, and he yelled to him, uh, please have mercy on me, don't kill me. So the commandant says then, get up, come over and face me. The poor guy stands up, makes three or four steps, and his knees just gave out from under him. He collapsed. The commandant goes over, kills him. Now it's Ben Lesser's turn, my turn. I remember going in front of that sawhorse, tiptoeing, putting my knee in, bending over without touching it, and I said to myself, Ben, this is it. No mistakes. You have to do it perfectly right if you want to see another hour of life. I remember doing this, going over, and I psyched myself out. I don't know how, because I'm trying to remember how could you withstand that. I put my heels, my knees in, and one man is pulling my trousers, the other one is hitting, and I'm counting. I swipe, right, pure, pure. And I'm feeling my flesh is being torn apart with those hits. Finally, Zwanzig, einundzwanzig, zweiundzwanzig, dreiundzwanzig, vierundzwanzig, fünfundzwanzig, twenty-five, I made it. You can hear a pin drop in that whole camp. 
because no one believed that anyone will survive this. So, quiet, silent, just like here, silent. The man who was pulling my trousers hard tells me in Yiddish, he says, go over and thank the commandant. So I stand up, blood's running down my trousers, and I walk up to him and I salute him. I say, Danke schön, Herr Commandant. Thank you very much, Herr Commandant. So when he heard it, he puts his hand on my collar, on my shirt collar like this, and I figure, what now? Is he going to kill me because I, I, I did it right? No, he twists me around facing those number tens who are still to be beaten. He says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this young, yeah, if you do it like this young one, you have nothing to worry about. While this is going on, there's a commotion at the gate. They caught those three inmates. And they were pulling them in, all oh, bloody, you couldn't recognize any of them. They were pulling them in, and they were beaten up. Now when the commandant saw that, like a child gets sick of a toy and doesn't want to play with it anymore. He told us number 10s to go back in our original lines and he orders his henchmen to bring down a portable gallow and we had to watch, watch how they hung each one separate. Now I remember the third one was a younger man he may have been religious, and there is a prayer before you die. There's a prayer. It's six words. That's all. I don't know if any of you heard it. It's called Shema Yisrael. Anyway, there's six words. And when he yelled out those words, they kicked the stool out from under him. They wouldn't let him complete the last two words which means God is one. Uh, they wouldn't let us, they were such sadists. But then they dismissed us like nothing ever happened and we went for our rations. And we got our rations. For weeks I could not lay on my back because of these welts. But it healed up, everything is fine. And one night we hear cannon fire. The front was closing in. So next morning, we were put to go to work. Now my uncle was already in the kitchen, and the rest of us were put to go to work. The loudspeakers said the camp is being evacuated. We're not working today. And lined up in rows of fives, and they start to march us out. My uncle, we couldn't say goodbye to him. He was in the kitchen. I never knew what happened to him because he did not survive. But my cousin and I, that was called the Death March. Why they called it the Death March? Because if you could not keep up pace with the soldiers, they simply shot you. And all day long while marching, you hear pop, pop people being shot. One week, two weeks. After two weeks, my cousin, who was older than I, about probably about five years older, got sick on me. He says, Ben, I can't, I can't continue. Let me sit down in the snow. Everyone will pass. They will shoot me. It's over with. I says, this will never happen. Both of us will survive this. You will remember this, what you just said. But but he couldn't walk. We had no shoes anymore. It was snow on the ground. We had burlaps wrapped around our feet, um, wet, frozen, and we were walking. And while we were walking, I had to assist him for the next week until we came to a place called Buchenwald. Buchenwald was another big concentration camp, almost like Auschwitz. Buchenwald, they line us up and they count us 
and they tell us to go into this barrack, they will feed you, you can take a shower, and but tomorrow morning I want you back in the same spot at 8 a.m. because Buchenwald is also being evacuated. So we're back, we had a good night because they gave us fresh clothes and everything. And that night, that morning, we were there, and they counted us, we were all there, and they started to march us out. They marched us out about 300 yards, and we see a line of cattle cars again. And they line us up, 82 cattle car, and they tell us to get in. Now my cousin was two weeks, so I pushed him out. I said, why don't you go and get a spot near a wall where we can rest our backs against the wall because I remember going to Auschwitz I was in the middle of a lot of people and it was terrible so he did he found a good spot against the wall and I followed him and they filled up 80 people they closed the door an hour later they opened the door and they threw in 80 breaths a bread for each person, a loaf of bread for each person. Well, you can picture this. Those people next to the door were grabbing four or five breads. And since I and my cousin were against the wall, we had nothing. And I don't know where we're going, how long we're going to be gone, no idea. So we had to get some something, a bread. He was too weak. So I started to climb over the sitting inmates to get to the door and wrestle out the bread from someone who had several. And as I'm climbing over the heads of the sitting inmates, one inmate had a pocket knife and he didn't like the idea and he stabs me. Now I felt the stab and I felt my mouth is filling up with blood. But I had to get a bread. I couldn't allow this to stop me. So I kept climbing in near the door. I see this man with four or five breaths, and I wrestle out the breath from him, and he punches me. But I did get one breath. I put it in my back pocket, and I went all the way back to my cousin. He says, man, what's happening to you? You're bleeding. And I put my finger here, and it goes right through my tongue. It was a big, big, and to this day, you can still see it, but you see, see it over my chin bone because I filled up. I was very skinny, it was in the middle of my throat, but now it's over my chin bone, but it's still here. Um, one week, I don't know where I got that sense to think about this. Most people who got the bread, they were so hungry, they were starving, they ate it. And I knew I only had a bread. We were supposed to have two. There were two people. So every night, in the middle of the night, I would ration a piece of bread the size of a half an egg to my cousin and a half an egg to me. And it lasted us two weeks. Everybody around us is dying. Either dead already or dying. Finally, After two weeks, I ran out of bread. Now the train is going for another week. Without any, whoever I look, they're dead. And we are still alive. So I think that bread somehow helped us because rationing. Even those people who had four or five breads, they died. They didn't have any water to congest it, to digest it with. So, I didn't see anyone alive. After the third week, we come to a place called Dacha. We didn't even know it was Dacha, but they stopped and they opened the door and they said, anyone who can still walk, go out, cross these tracks into that camp. So my cousin and I, and maybe there were another three or four people coming out of that. The rest of the people were all dead. And we came in, in Dachau, we see a mountain full of dead bodies in front of the crematorium. Later I found out they ran out of coal. Why they even bothered with us, 
be still alive? I guess they figured, well, we'll die anyway. So they put us in a barrack on the ground. He says, you sit, lay here, and the two of us lay there. One day, two day, and the third day, you hear liberation by crying, Americans, Americans, liberate. And that's why we went out and we saw the inmates crawling on their hands and knees and kissing the boots of the GIs. They were like gods to us. That's you. I can't imagine how we felt. You saved our lives, but our life was sort of tittering, tottering between life and death. We, we were half alive. And I remember taking my cousin in the middle of the yard and everybody is jumping for joy. I just want to tell you something. If you see films, newsreels, the striped people jumping for joy that they're being liberated, those were not the Jewish people. Those were political prisoners or otherwise, but the Jewish prisoners could barely walk, not alone jump for joy and smile and laugh. Because those people, they got liberated. They have homes to go back to. They have loved ones who are waiting for them. What about the Jewish people? They had no homes to go back to. No one waiting out there to give you a hug or a kiss. What now? We were happy, said the killing is going to stop. But at the same time, we were left to fend for ourselves. And many of the people died even after that. So I remember, um, we stood there and a GI walks up to us and they open up a can of Spam. It smelled so good to us and we were so starved that we started to eat a little bit of this. And we ate part of it. Both of us came down with dysentery. It was a deadly disease. And my cousin, the night of liberation, dies in my arm. He probably would have died anyway, with or without the food, because he was very weak. And they came to take him away. As they came to take him away, I followed. But they made a few steps and my knees gave out and I collapsed. They put me to a side. And that night, a man walks up to me. He introduces himself as a Jesuit priest. He says he came here with the monks, with the nuns and doctors from France and they're opening up a field hospital in the yard of Dacha. He's going to take me to the field hospital. So he picks me up like a bag of bones, which I was. He puts me on his shoulder and he carries me to the field hospital. But he told me something on the way that I'll never forget. In Polish. He says, Benek, you went through an awful lot only for being born to, to Jewish family, to Jewish parents. Why? He says, but don't you ever abandon your noble religion. Now to hear that in 1945 from a Jesuit Polish priest, was very unusual, very unusual. You might hear it today, but not then. So I remember that. He took me into the field hospital, and none walked over to me, take my vitals, and they laid me down on a cot with a white sheet. And I laid down, and this is all I remember. I passed out. Two and a half months later, I wake up in Santa Tertullian, that's a monastery in Bavaria. 
The monks gave up one building to create a hospital for the survivors of Dacha, or just a hospital. So I was in a bed, and I woke up after two and a half months, and I remember the nun was so happy to see me open my eyes. She came running and yelling to all the other nurses, he's alive, he's alive, he came back. And she came and brought me a mirror. And I looked at this mirror, I looked pretty good, because I remembered myself two months ago as a Muslim, a walking dead skeleton. I only weighed 65 pounds at the age of 16, so you can imagine what it was like. But I think I'm running out of time, and I could tell you mother, many other incidents, but it would take two and a half hours. But now I leave it open to you. If you have any questions, by all means, ask. auditorium, you'll notice there's a microphone right there, you have one right over here, and there's another one right over here. So in the spirit of resiliency, um, we would love for some people to ask some questions about, you know, how resiliency helped him, or if you have a question, uh, please, we have the next 20, 25 minutes to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, most of you received is a four pin. That little pin, I hope you all got it. If not, as you leave, please pick one up. This pin says, remember the Holocaust. Remember the Holocaust. I don't expect you to wear it, but you must have family, or if you don't, someday you will have. And if your kids ever find it in a drawer or in a jewelry box and they ask you, mommy or daddy, what is this strange looking pin? Then you tell them, it means remember the Holocaust. There was a Holocaust. I listened to Holocaust survivor. This is what I'm trying to get across. I started a foundation called the Hor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. And that foundation is going to be on for generations to come. And we also have something else. If you didn't receive it, when you go out, please take this. This is a bookmarker. It's a shout-out bookmarker. Now, we're looking for six million shout-outs to compensate for the six million silenced voices. Okay, you'll say, well, so you shout out, what then? No, we started on our website, the shout out. Your shout out is going to be saved for generations to come. Imagine your great, great grandchildren will be able to punch in your name and your shout out will come out. And if you wish, you can even submit your photograph. So you shout out along with a photograph will come out. And this is going to be there for generations. I made sure of that. I prepaid it. So there's no question in my, in my mind. And my children and my grandchildren, they all work for the Four Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. And they all, wow, they will continue what I'm doing. My daughter will be speaking when I'm not around. Any questions? Well, that was a remarkable story. Um, I was just going to ask, what's the culture like in uh, Hungary? I didn't understand. Uh, the, the culture? Like, what was the culture like uh, back in the day? What was the culture? What was the culture like in those days? Oh, uh, yes. Well, obviously, it was Nazism. You had to be a Nazi. If you're not a Nazi, you had no right to live. You know, I talk in schools, and people ask me those, that question, too. 
Hitler foresaw a um, Übermenschen, that a special kind of human being that is supposed to be the, the prime human. Now in his view, it had to be the Nordic type, blonde hair, blue eyes, which he himself did not qualify for. But this is what he saw. And he foresaw a future with only these special type of people, super, supermen. And everyone obviously had to think Nazism. If you were not a Nazi, you had no right to live. So imagine a world, if he succeeded, where everybody looked the same and everybody was thinking the same Nazism. It would be like a bunch of ants following a leader. The beauty in this world is that we are different. We look different. We think differently. But respect our differences. And instead of hating them, we're all God's creations. And we should be able to get along with each other. It doesn't matter how they think or what religion they are or what they look like. They're a human being. I always say there is only one race in this world. And that's the human race. That's all. And it doesn't matter how you look, what you believe in. That's wonderful. But instead of hating... Thank you, sir. That was very good. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Mr. Lesser, we've got another question. Yeah. Mr. Lesser, thank you very much for being with us today. I recently had the privilege to watch a video on the story of another survivor who was one of the twins that was experimented on by Dr. Mengele's at Auschwitz. And uh, ultimately, I believe in, in the mid-90s, she was having a lot of uh, emotional difficulties and ultimately came to the realization that even though she would never forget that she needed to forgive and for her own peace of mind uh, the men that had done this to her and her sister. And she said that that was a, a very controversial decision among survivors. And so I wanted to ask your opinion uh, for personal resiliency, where you think forgiveness comes into that. If I heard how I feel, how you Very good question. Resiliency. I feel that it's all a matter of choices. We all can choose what we want to make our life in, how we want to succeed in life or what you want to become in life. God gave us all free will, and we have these choices. So, resiliency, I know what Mengele was able to do, and what he did to a lot of people while I was in Auschwitz. But you're right, most of the survivors couldn't take it. They, they were happy they were alive, but they lived from day to day a status quo. They lost their will to continue and live and make a beautiful life for yourself, for your family, and have a reason for living. I chose the other way. Because I'll tell you the truth, for many years, I myself wouldn't tell my kids, my two daughters, what I went through in the camps. Because I didn't want to um, contaminate their way of thinking. I wanted them to grow up as plain American children 
going to schools with different nationalities, have friends from different nationalities, but they knew that I was a survivor because obviously there were no grandparents, there small families, no uncles, no aunts. But they never bothered to ask me until when my grandson, when he was in his fifth grade, calls me up, he says, Papa, my teacher found out that you're a Holocaust survivor. And she was wondering if you would come and tell her story. Well, what do you, I had really made this, made, I had a hard time deciding, what do I do? What do you tell fifth graders in a school? Um, but my grandson wants to know. My daughters were already grown up and they have children of their own. Why should I hide it at this point? I said, I'm going. But I remember going to that school and when I opened up to touch the handle of the door, it's like going to a principal's office. I was <laughs> scared. What am I going to do to tell the fifth graders? But they gave me from 10 to 11 to speak. And I started to speak from 10 to 11. These kids were glued to their chairs. Their mouths were open and full eyes on me. And then from 11 to 12, the teacher didn't stop me. I continued. And the lunch bell rang mid 12 o'clock. Nobody budged. So she had to chase them out. But instead of going to eat, they surrounded me in the hallway with questions. This is when I realized then, you cannot be silent anymore. The world has to know. And I saw those eager eyes and ears of fifth graders. And my grandson gave me a big smile. He was pleased with what was going on. But you know, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, many of the Holocaust survivors were strong and they made beautiful life for themselves and their family. Um, but not all, I have to agree, not all of them did. But those poor guys were in such bad shape. If, if it was a mother and a father who survived and they saw their children being slaughtered, what can you expect of those people? They are living, they're happy, they're alive. But there's no ecstasy in living. But many survivors, just like myself, vowed to continue to do something to keep the memory alive. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for telling your story, sir. So, uh, I remember you were saying at the end of your story that once you got liberated, that you really had nothing to go back to, and that it was, you didn't really feel, I guess, too excited, because, you know, you couldn't go back to nothing. But, uh, what got you through, to, got you through your day-to-day -day experiences? Like, what did you have to tell yourself to get through each and every day? Very good question. But, you know, I have to tell you that, not because I'm pushing my book, but in my book, <laughs> I, I do tell you what exactly happened to me step by step and how I was able to overcome it and change my beautiful life. But it's not something that I could tell you in a few minutes of answering. Um, it took me a while through different experiences but one thing I knew, in order to succeed, remember I came to America at the age of 18, and I had, I didn't speak a word English. I had no education, because my education stopped at 10 and a half. I had no money, hardly family. My sister, she came here a few months earlier, but she didn't have anything. And I had to make a life for myself. So, the only answer I can give you, if you study hard, and if you work hard, you can succeed in, in this wonderful country, America, 
anything you wish, you can, is within your reach. Who is stopping you? No one is holding a gun to your head that you can't do it. If you really will it, you will succeed. And I wanted it, and I wanted to succeed. When I came to America, and I saw the New York skyline, when the ship pulled in, and I saw something that I said, Ben, this is day one of your life. From this point on, you will succeed in life. You will make something out of yourself. And that's all it took. And I was able to do it. How I did it is in my book. But I will tell you this. Um, whatever you do, whatever profession you are in, it doesn't matter. Always be the best in this profession. And I don't mean good or very good, but the absolute best, you will succeed. If you make up your mind, never be a clock watcher. Oh, it's five o'clock, it's time to go home. Never do that. After the time, you ask your boss, is there anything else I can do to help you? Anytime you work for a company, See what you can do to make that company prosper. Don't just be clockwise, oh, I put in my eight hours, goodbye. No. See what you can do. Now, you will succeed if you do that. Just remember to be the absolute best in whatever you do. And find out what you can do for this company, even though it's not your job to enhance things. Be interested in every aspect of the, of the business, even though this is not what they hired you for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, sir. I think we've all heard that adversity can bring out both the best and worst in people. Uh, my question is, if you witness people collapse morally in their attempt to survive, and if so, what made the difference between them and people who were able to adhere to their values? Very good question. Uh, yes, there were many couples. A couple was in each camp the person who was overseeing inside the camp. And many of these couples were brutal to their own people. Not all of them. I know some of those couples, even in ghettos, they had a police station, and the policemen were called couples. Now, they didn't have weapons or anything. They may have had a baton, that's all. But they, their job was to keep order inside the ghetto and to do whatever the Nazis tell them. They wanted a hundred people come out to dig ditches. It was their job to find these people. So many people hated them. And some of, some of that hatred was, was real. And, and I think they deserved to be hate, hated because they really had no choice. If they didn't do what they were told, they were either beaten up or killed. So yes, there were Jewish people in the camps that were overseeing. They were called kapos, and not all of them were very nice. Something in human nature, if you give them power, sometimes they abuse it. And this is something we have to be very careful and watch, always be on the watch that that should not happen. You are a human being like your, your buddy, your friend, your neighbor. We all live in this world and we have a right to enjoy our lives. Everyone, please rise and thank Mr. Ben Lesser for being here today.
The day's event concluded with a gift presentation to Mr. Ben Lesser, a token of appreciation for sharing his incredible story of resilience to the soldiers of the National Training Center. At this time, we're presenting Mr. Lesser with a certificate of appreciation that reads, on behalf of the commanding general, soldiers of the National Training Center and Fort Irwin community, and the United States Army, we sincerely thank you for sharing your experiences during our diversity and inclusion training. Your heartfelt expressions have left all of us with a renewed respect and honor for those who were victims, those who took action, and those who survived and witnessed the Holocaust. We thank you for your talking, taking the time to make this possible for all of us. Thank you so much. And before we close with the Army song, I would just like to reemphasize something that Mr. Lesser said. People were crawling on their hands and knees to kiss the feet of the GIs, people they said they looked at as gods. So if anybody ever wonders why we do what we do, there's the answer right there.